রিভু আমরা শুরু করব কখন একটু বলো Dear moderator, just you start your talk just after 10 seconds. Okay. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, dear participants. Today is the 52nd session, lecture session. And today our presenter is our international moderator and advisor, Chaudhary Hafiz Asan sir. He will discuss on case-based ECG discussion. Before starting the session, I'd like to request Professor Abdul Wadu Chaudhary sir to say a few words about Chaudhary Hafiz Asan sir, who is our regular contributor, our advisor. I request Professor Abdul Wadu Chaudhary sir to speak a few words about Chaudhary Hafiz Asan sir. Wadu sir. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to everybody. Actually, we don't need to tell too much about uh, Professor Chaudhary Hafizul Hassan. He's a star in himself. He was a star when he was a student of Dhaka Middle College. And we, or when we were students, we have heard many stories about him, about his intellectual prowess, about his depression, and the energy he showed and he is still showing and he was quite famous for that i won't say any more about him because you will come to know him with his work with his presentation let us together enjoy the presentation by professor chaudhary hafizul hassan Hafiz bhai, aap namo te mute kora. You have to unmute Hafiz bhai. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was talking to Rafiq bhai, so I put it on mute. So, um, so I'm going to present the, the <coughs> cases in the, in the first part and then um, then the second part, I'm going to um, show you some EKGs that is um, that we um, had uh, in last one week. And then at the end, if we have time, I'm going to show some examples from American College of uh, Cardiology um, self-assessment program to give you an idea that what um, we actually uh, face when we take the uh, American Board of Internal Medicine uh, Speciality Board Exams. So um, this is a 60 year old. It was in our hospital, recent COVID, and they did not get vaccinated. Went to urgent care, pulse ox was low. So this is COVID time. So I wanted to show you and it will bring up some management issues. 
So chest pain. And uh, afebrile and the pulse ox now on oxygen better. And uh, this is the EKG. Any comment? So uh, they I'm called us. They called us after the troponin came positive. It is like less than one, but my, mildly positive, and they said what we do. So any one uh, want to say anything at this point? All those are pending: the uh, blood count, chemistry, D dimer. Echo is also uh, requested. So uh, interesting, because if you look at this, this, this marginal uh, sinus tachycardia, and then what we noticed that there is S1, Q3, T3, which is actually not so common. Usually you see sinus tachycardia non-specific STT changes. So this was the chest X-ray. Uh, and uh, you know, in medical school, we have learned that typically in pulmonary embolism or massive pulmonary, submassive pulmonary embolism, lung is usually not wet. But this is a, a COVID situation. Lung can look like wet. And uh, it may mimic like COVID. It may mimic like uh, CHF atypical pneumonia, all these are differential. But interestingly, the uh, BNP, and then this is the echo. So S1, Q3, T3, and this echo, any, any observation? Archie size. And uh, uh, I'm requesting uh, uh, Atarvai and Wadud, if you could kindly look at the chat line because there are something coming up in the chat line. So- um, Dilated RV, people are saying. Yeah, do have the dilated RV. Them. But interestingly, if you look at the RV apex is moving, but yeah. RV free wall is not moving. Aziz Bhai, you agree? Sorry, I just see that you are here. <laughs> Aziz Bhai, you are on mute. Yeah, that's uh, actually we saw in the first uh, view of the echo. Uh, first of all, you, yeah. you're right on that S1, Q3, Q, uh, and P3 and sinus tag and chest pain. Though it's not a very specific sign, but if you have it, you start thinking about potential specific diagnosis. And also you verify that with the echocardiogram first, uh, you know, seeing we saw RV enlargement and we can see uh, in this view, short axis, also RV enlargement and the free wall movement that we talked about, we call McConnell sign. We can see better here in the four chamber view, uh, RV enlargement and some septal bounce there. Uh, so, so there's definitely significant pressure and overload and probably volume overload slide in the RV. So that suggests with acute chest pain, you have to look at few things without if, first of all, if no changes in EKG, you have to think about several particular differential diagnosis, right? One, uh, in the COVID era, you need to think about whether the patient has pulmonary embolism. Uh, and second, you know, RV infarction is a possibility, but we didn't see any changes on the ECG that's suggestive of that potential. Bishal is saying a McConnell sign. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is actually classic McConnell. I could not exactly. give you another mm -hmm. example. This is a classic McConnell sign. And look at this uh, saddle embolus. Yes. In the, this is the saddle embolus in the city. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that the uh, 
American Board of Internal Medicine uh, slash cardiology, if it is a chronic thromboembolism, they prefer that uh, you do ventilation perfusion. In acute pulmonary embolism, the mode of uh, the choice uh, is the uh, CTA uh, of the chest. So, um, you know, the I just wanted to make sure that those uh, who are still in the fellowship or residency go through this uh, classic Wells criteria and all that. But in the COVID time, we need to have a different kind of threshold for suspecting uh, from uh, PE. Very, very important uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, suspecting COVID, uh, suspecting pulmonary embolism in COVID time. This is a classic McConnell sign. And in this case, um, you need to, you can't wait because the mortality can be really high. Um, and, and therefore you need to make a plan that, you know, this is the definition of massive, submassive and non-massive PE. And um, don't be fooled by the troponins and then little bit of a troponin that can be also, I mean, a BNP that can be also high. So in this case, because of the RV strain and, and significant hypoxia, he was a candidate for thrombolytics. And then subsequent care, we are now promoting the DOACs because of the convenience and probably overall superiority over the uh, Coumadin. However, we also have the catheter uh, uh, and device therapy for the uh, Submassive or massive P. Um, so I just wanted to show you that. And our patient went went for catheter directed therapy, thrombolytics, and then heparin. We also can use uh, penumbra or thrombectomy catheter, and also ultrasonic guided and ultrasonic um, uh, devices to help and augment the perfusion in the pulmonary circulation. So, um, yeah, so, uh, so uh, these are the uh, uh, strategies for the COVID uh, era pulmonary embolism. I don't know uh, how uh, we can uh, manage uh, in Bangladesh, for example, in terms of uh, anybody doing any device therapy or uh, anybody giving lytics um, in the in the uh, ER? Actually, uh, the, some lytics have been uh, used in COVID patients, particularly, but in the uh, ICU and with good results. And now they are happy, uh, LTPs is available and they are using it. Mm -hmm. But and then uh, very limited. Yeah. So uh, just to uh, go to another patient, and this is going to be a discussion point. Uh, this is actually a patient from a, another city that came in on uh, Saturday night, 81 year old. Uh, I try to show you the cases that I encounter because it gives you a perspective about what crosses my mind. And I usually think that what if this patient was in Bangladesh? It just comes to my mind. So this is no exception because this is 81 year old and went to the um, hospital uh, about 100 miles from here. And this is the EKG on the left. He actually is a very good 81 year old and you can see the date and time on the EKG on Saturday. His chest pain almost for like six hours. And then he went there with tight, heavy on and off chest pain, not remitting with nitroglycerin and hemodynamically stable sinus rhythm. And his risk factors uh, in terms of coronary disease, no hypertension, no diabetes, and no MI in the past, no family history, 
does not smoke. He has, he has been a very good 81. So with that EKG, uh, he got uh, thrombolytics and we gave uh, the ready place 1010 and then shipped to our hospital by helicopter. And then when I met in the ER, uh, I assessed. But the question is that um, looking at these two EKGs, what's your first comment? And then I can tell you the uh, clinical part and then we can discuss the next part because this is actually a pharmacoinvasive strategy. Yeah. And, uh, and the question is how you assess with the EKGs the uh, subsequent part of the pharmacoinvasive strategy. That means you're talking about whether we, are, we have to do uh, uh, the strategy of doing the angiogram within 24 hours and intervention if needed. Are you? Yeah. So I'm just saying those who are still in uh, residency and fellowship in cardiology, we need to be very careful about the terminology so that we know what we are talking about in terms of STEMI care. Primary PCI, that means you committed to go to the cath lab right from the get-go. And then in pharmacoinvasive means cath lab is away more than two hours. And then you want to give lytics with the commitment that you will do the invasive angiogram two to four hours after, two to 24 hours after, uh, and preferably within 24 hours. There are some literature now coming that maybe 24, 48, and maybe 48 even hours. 72 is probably not bad as long as you know that the patient is doing well. Rescue is that there is no resolution of the STEMI and you want to go in for rescue. We don't use the term facilitated, which means that you do all kinds of lytics and glycoprotein 2B3A and then, and then enhance the perfusion. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, now we are mostly embracing the term pharmacoinvasive with the commitment that you will look into the, um, the coronary angiogram. And one of the reasons to look into coronary angiogram, just to be clear, that if you just do, if you just do the, uh, if you just do the uh, lytics only, there is a chance of reocclusion and the reocclusion can be anywhere between 15 to 20%. And when the reocclusion happens, the, the mortality goes like a skyrocket, few folds higher. So therefore it is mandated that following the lytics, we should look at the angiogram. And to clarify, after the lytics, you don't keep the patient in the non-PCI hospital. You give lytics and you transfer to the PCI hospital, regardless whether the patient is going into shock, whether the patient is going into uh, 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 still uh, not responding to lytics or responding to lytics, no matter what, you transfer to the PCI hospital exactly for that reason. So the patient now is here, 81 year old, you can argue, should we give lytics uh, like a, a a half dose or not, because some literature say above 75, think about that. And then question is, you need to check what they gave and what we should do now. Are we convinced that the lytics uh, given in prompt the other hospital has worked or not? And if it, if, it ha if it has not worked, then I need to go in now. We try to not to go in immediately, because it is a very bleeding, bleeding milieu. And therefore, within the first two hours, usually we try not to. But if it is a rescue, then we go in anyway. And radial is preferred, radial approach. But if it is shock, then I usually go femoral um, because, because of the situation that may be out of control uh, by the radial. So, 
Dr. Oren Maskey, what do you think? You think that reperfusion been established by EKG? Oh, well, first question is, I'm not very, I mean, I need to take a detailed history of this patient. If looking at this uh, EKG, well, there are few uh, inferior changes and reciprocal ST depression in one and AVL and some degree in, yes. So- Sorry, the uh, EKG on your right is, is the post lytics and it is not the best EKG. Yeah, in the, on the left side. So based on some subtle changes in ST, I do not know the detailed history of uh, this patient. The, the patient had 10 out of 10 chest pain. Okay. And after lytics, as he was flying, huh? the chest pain gone. By the time he arrived, chest pain has completely gone. He's saying zero. Okay. And the EKG on your right, So, I mean, if you follow the recommendations, it depends on which country you are. If you're in Western country, you have to follow the recommendation two to 24 hours. Do an angio C and if uh, do the culprit vessels, whether a patient is stable. So this patient is totally stable. You have to do angiogram two to 24 hours later. So there's no question of doing medical management. In a country like ours, we prefer to do medical management because, because of financial constraints. So if you're yeah. in US, you have to do angiogram. So recommendation, as you have said, if you do a thrombolysis, irrespective of outcome, if the patient has failed thrombolysis with ongoing chest pain, no ST resolutions, arrhythmias, then hemodynamic deterioration, in that case, you'll have to do at the earliest. In this scenario, yeah. even if the patient is uh, stable, do angiogram and do PCI on the culprit vessels. Yeah, I think uh, the financial issue is always there, but uh, and it will be there, but we should know the current recommendations and the, the collective experience around the world. The pharmacoinvasive can be as good as primary PCI. And uh, so the a couple of interesting things. How much Plavix clopidogrel we should give, or should we give Ticagrelor? He's 81. So by, by definition, by FDA warning, we don't give prasugrel, right? So say more than 75, weight less than 60, and then TIA stroke, we don't, we avoid prasugrel. For ticagrelor, there is no such um, warning. But the question is, in this case, what you normally do, do you give uh, Plavix 75 or you give Plavix 300? Uh, I can comment on that. Uh, basically, uh, you have to look at that, what's the age of the patient. And if you're giving thrombolytic therapy, a Plavix a clopidogrel would be preferred, 75 milligram, not the loading dose that you used to do that. Uh, so uh, since the patient was given lytics, so clopidogrel 75 milligram along with aspirin would be preferred, definitely with other therapy statin and beta blocker if possible. But if the patient goes to primary intervention, that's a different scenario. The dose is different. But, uh, but 75 above age, Plavix should be 75 milligram. And this is important because this patient should not be given the full dose, full loading dose. It should be given only 75 milligram. That's the guideline direction. Okay. And Adit Bhai was so, saying. So so what is the contraindication of giving ticaglobin in this patient? Because age is not a contraindication. Uh, I think the, uh, we, we don't have the real data. I'm not sure, Dr. Asano, that we have some in, in your mind, but we don't have the real data with the thrombolytics along with the ticagrelor. We have the most data with the ticagrelor with the intervention, but not with thrombolytics. So I think most. I don't know anybody uh, will uh, make any comment. Although in the Chinese COMIT trial, that was mm -hmm. the fear that giving full bolus dose may cause bleeding Age. problem in the elderly. Mm -hmm. Most of us will agree: do not give 600 of Plavix for sure. And then the, at that time there was not ticagrelor. So question is: now that the ticagrelor is here. Should we give ticagrelor or we stick to the uh, study experience? So, uh, interventionalist will 
violate all this every day. <laughs> and, but the question is that you, you need to appreciate the bleeding risk. As long as you appreciate the bleeding risk, then, um, then we are good. So um, Plavix 300 versus 75, yes, 75 is the recommended because it is the time, particularly in this guy. And then you cat 20, uh, you know, two to 24 hours later, if you are going to the pharmacoinvasive pathway. I did a bedside echo and overall LV function was good inferior. And it is a uncomplicated inferior and uh, no, no further issue. I have a question, Chaudhary so, Asan. Yeah. Regarding the ECG, thanks for excellent discussion regarding the management purpose. So, previous ECG, please. As I, do you have any explanation regarding the second ECG? There is incomplete RBB after the. So, what is the criteria of complete resolution? And do you have any explanation about the RBB that developed in the second ECG? Okay, so uh, I don't, I think this is a noise looking like that. Mm -hmm. I doubt that this is uh, incomplete RBB new. Uh, but because I'm using Rafik bias criteria that if you can't explain an artifact, then call it artifact. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't have, I actually told them to do a, a fresh uh, uh, EKG, but I don't have that. I, I left, so I don't have it. What was your Another second co question? Another comment I'd like to make, uh, okay. as Dr. Uh, Arun was mentioning that in third world countries, uh, what's the right approach to do in this type of patient? Yes, according to the Western country, you have to do like pharmacoinvasive approach, like you do the thromboliding and then go and do cap. But I think it's the right coronary artery. Overall, uh, you know, supply of blood is not like LED territory distribution. Yeah, and we see quite good resolution of the ST here and the symptoms free. I think it's reasonable and because before angioplasty, we used to see a lot of patients with that and with the right uh, coronary involvement with the uh, thrombolytic therapy, if they resolved, we see these patients relatively do well, even without intervention. Uh, so, I mean, uh, in third world countries, reasonable, reasonable to continue treating them, probably with the medical management. If they have problem, recurrent problem, then you might need to go for uh, angiogram. But the current guidelines, I agree with Dr. Hassan that, yeah, we have to do a cap within, uh, uh, you know, uh, 24 to 72 hours. And, but, and but it's reasonable that, to do that, that medical management. Very important point that if we are planning not to do cap as mm -hmm. a mandatory um, strategy, then I think we should be a powerful antiplatelet and also mm -hmm. keep on uh, Lovenox, enoxyparin, then, mm -hmm. then heparin. If we are not planning for cath in the next few hours and the kidney function is good, enoxyparin, one milligram per kilo BID dose actually is way better because much more predictable anticoagulation with probably less bleeding than just heparin and, 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 and have this problem of monitoring with APTT. And I would definitely go for Ticagrelor, although we don't have any current stand on this. Yeah. But if you look at ESC, Indian, Indian uh, guidelines also, in the, even in the ESC website. So I do not know whether pharmacoinvasive strategy or overall STEMI, we have any Bangladesh edition or not. Maybe we can think about uh, sort of what is practical, that if the clinician thinks that pharmacoinvasive is not practical, then maybe we should give lytics and then think about Lovenox and then DAPT and, and very quickly give statin and also oral beta blocker. I would not like to use IV beta blocker in the acute MI situation. Yeah, it is very important. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in our country, many of the patients, particularly the elderly, they're very underweight. Should we be using the 90 milligram dose or should we be using the 60 milligram dose in these patients? In the, in the ticagrelor? Yeah. You know, so I want to go on a compromise, like in the acute phase, use 90 milligram, but then after a month, lower down. 
because the bleeding risk is going to be a cumulative risk over time because you want to keep them at least a year on debt. So maybe we can lower down. Even you can think about 60 milligram before discharge, but keep on high dose in the acute phase, particularly if you are not looking at the coronary. Yeah. So um, this is uh, our usual practice. Uh, this EKG, what do you, uh, we take a poll. Uh, what do you think about this EKG? Uh, I am giving you the computer read. Uh, this <laughs> is from this week. It says atrial flutter two to one block. Yes, Ripu, start the poll. Sorry, I lost that slide. I'm, I'm sorry. I think you had before the pulmonary embolism slide. Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, I just threw something here. Uh, patient uh, was in the trauma after a motor vehicle and I put Commotio cordis, so just don't use that because that's like a sudden blunt trauma giving arrhythmia and can give you death. Uh, but I just threw it because uh, the uh, trauma resident was uh, asking us that can it be commotio cordis? But that is like a, even a cricket ball sometimes can find an impeccable timing and then give you R on T blunt trauma and can give you nasty arrhythmia and cardiac arrest. But this is not the case here. So the, okay, let's see how the poll is. This is the time I miss Rafik by most. <laughs> Please vote participant. Sinus tachycardia, very good. Yeah, so, so it is about paying attention. As Rovik Bhai always says, look at all leads, particularly for the rhythm. You know, we, the interventionalist, we pay too much attention on the morphology and ST segment, but the EP guys, they don't read EKG right away. They take time to look at the rhythm, particularly rhythm is a big issue. So this is sinus tachycardia and not flutter. Um, so, any comment, uh, Atharvai? Yes, actually, seven participants actually in favor of the atrial flutter, possibly because the heart rate is 150. When the, yes. heart, rate is, when the heart rate is regular, 150 narrow QRS, there is always suspicion that that may be a case of the atrial flutter. So, this is unlikely to be atrial flutter as because clear PFs are visible before QRS complexes. And then in V1, the P wave is clearly visible before the QRS complex, not in the midline, and there is no flutter waves. So absence of the flutter waves, just visible clean cut QA before the QRS. This is in favor of the sinus tachycardia, but because of the heart rate 150, still there should be a suspicion that we cannot totally exclude the possibility of the atrial flutter in this case. So I tell you this uh, story, I don't know why I told you, our GI fellow came into the emergency room, guest, uh, GI fellow with the flat, uh, palpitation, heart rate 150. The cardiology fellow thinks this is flutter and called me for cardioversion. So I went there, I see this is sinus stack. And, and the, the GI fellow says, you know, COVID is done and then uh, family members have fever. And low grade and his temperature was 38. So I said, still do the usual. And this, his, his TSH was non-detectable and it was sinus tag. 
So always do the usual thing and you will not miss it. 150 is a good rule for a tail flutter, but you need to convince that you see the flutter waves and you cannot call it when there is a uh, good P waves. So, uh, okay. So another important thing, uh, this is an EKG in a 99 year old. See that EKG 99 year old and it is yes. called atrial fibrillation. And uh, before I, I go to see the patient, they are saying, you know, uh, the, <clears throat> what about the dose of uh, epixaban, 99 year old creatinine 0.9. And, uh, and what should we do for a fee cat vast? And so the EKG diagnosis has downline many implications. So it is critical that we read the EKG right and then get the diagnosis right. Otherwise, the subsequent um, decision making can be misleading. And I tell you, uh, you, got, you have, for the faculty, I tell you this, you are not facing this problem yet in Bangladesh, but we are facing here. Everything is in the computer. The EKG is in the computer. There is nothing in the chart. So unless you see the EKG yourself, the fellow will tell you, oh, EKG is a fib, and then you make the decision. So I have a rule that as a clinician, you need to look at the EKG chest X-ray cath echo, no report business. Look at this yourself and convince yourself. So this is an example where the computer is reading is a fib, and it is totally wrong because this is actually sinus rhythm with PVCs and the, the patient doesn't need anything in terms of anticoagulation and chat mask. So it is important that uh, we need to figure that out. So, um, and then computer changed its mind, look at the timing, Whenever the computer changed, because it now it is distinct and computer now reading uh, is right. Okay, so what about this one? The previous one. Okay, this one. So that lady went into tachycardia with the right bundle left axis. He, she had right bundle left axis before. So nothing new. So if you look at the only lead V4, I can still see that there is P wave. And also a look at the V1 lead at the very end of the T wave, there's some bump there. Yeah, exactly. uh, in, yeah that, that's a P wave. And, uh, and also lead three, pro, yeah, I, I could probably see the P wave, but, but, but V1 is definitely seen. And you can argue in V4, but V1, I definitely can see that P wave. It's a sinus tag yeah. with right bundle morphology and probably left axis. As you look, actually, uh, do we consider it sinus tag? Uh, let's let's go back. I still think it's a sinus tag, sinus tag cardia, because of the P wave I could see at the V1 lead at the very end. But look at the uh, uh, Let's see. negative T wave and the peak of the nadir of the T wave. There is something in there. Uh, what lead? V1. Look at the T wave. Yes, something at the bottom of the T wave. That is the yeah, bottom of the T wave. That is distortion of the T wave. I think and Dr. Raj is actually. I That's actually suggestive of flutter. Uh, okay. <laughs> 
Now, this is the regular narrow complex tachycardia, maybe atrial flutter, but I can't see any visible sinus P wave as because in lead two, the T wave is clearly visible, but there is no, dis that is the, any P wave like we put the next QRS complex in lead two. And in lead V1, Professor Wadud nicely mentioned there is some distortion at the mid of the T wave that indicates some retrograde P wave. That is a retrograde P wave, what happened in case of the supraventricular tachycardia. So let me tell you what I did with this patient. There was a clearly two camps, sinus tack, atrial flutter. And there is a third camp, which is AV nodal re Yeah. 90 year old. Uh, and I and I said, uh, if it does not come again, then we'll forget it. Uh, but if it comes back again, I'm not going to send this patient for ablation. Uh, okay. But I think most likely this is a atrial flutter. Uh, common things common. And uh, but uh, we did not see it again in the whole hospital so far. So. I don't know whether I should commit itself for anticoagulation or anything yet. She's 99. Um, and I don't have any, sometimes in, many, in clinical situations, we just see things, but we may not be able to figure it out. We just keep a differential diagnosis and then go from there. However, we did want to look at the CT in case it is a, pulmonary embolism or not, those, those things are good, echo is okay. But did, did you try to slow down the heart rate and see what it, what is it show? <laughs> By the time we went, we I actually yeah. wanted to give adenosine. Uh, nothing wrong to give adenosine because it will slow down and may reveal the flutter waves. But by the time we went, the cardiac resolved. So uh, that is another thing that it tells me that is probably not sinus stack. If it is sinus stack, it does not go away like that. But, is, so, if, we, but we, if we consider the differential Chaudhuri, the ASBT yeah. should be the number one diagnosis. That is, ASBT yeah. should be the first, then atrial flutter, then the sinus tag. It be, exactly. ASBT should be considered and I, I, I agree. I love the term SVT, but problem is our EP guy, Dr. Gururaj, I actually invited him to come one of these days to talk. He doesn't like the term SVT because he said the SVT is a broad spectrum term. Yes. So actually, I, I want to mean only AVRT and AVNRT. SVT means okay. this. Yes. Yes. AVNRT and AVRT. Uh, so one thing that with those. Or AV, sorry. It, is the heart rate is not going to be higher with that? With AVNRT, relatively, it's 139 only heart rate. Yes, possible slow. AVNRT is possible. Uh -huh. But in that ECG, regular narrow complex tachycardia, mm -hmm. heart rate is 139, not 150. There is no clear P waves before the QRS complex. Rather, mm -hmm. P wave okay, distortion right. and in between the QRS complex in the V1, all in favor of the AVRT. Otherwise, could it be HL tag? Unlikely, yes, because. Originating near, near to the sinus node. In that case, also, you want to see. P wave like something before the QRS complex, but here is nothing. There was Actually, some. By a very good point. I went back to see whether there is any abrupt onset, abrupt. Yeah. And uh, sometimes the initiation of a PSC can trigger yes. this. I could not find that. But good, okay. very good point. So seeing only that is easy, as there are some uh, uh, discernible Q wave in the V4, V5. Yeah. Uh, and also a notch-like thing in the V1 T wave, uh, distorting it. This this is one possibility that it can be a actual tachycardia. Yeah. So that this is under the umbrella of <laughs> okay. narrow complex SVT yes, yes, yes. and what are the yeah. Sir, <laughs> one or one thing. So can what do you think? What do you think about this EKG? What is the clinical scenario? Chest pain. It's written in the, at the top. I don't think that I give. Did I give any... Um... Uh, 50 scenario history of hypertension CAD presents with chest pain. 
So I don't. Please vote, dear participant. Please vote. Now vote, but I, I don't, I don't have any question here. I cannot move my slide. Okay, good. So uh, I didn't ask any question. I just wanted to show that in the right context, the uh, biphasic T wave could be like Wallen sign and could be concerning for the uh, for the uh, uh, LAD disease. So this is uh, an EKG on a 39-year-old. And I picked up because they did not call us uh, for routine checkup for immunization. Um, so you notice that there is early repo. And it is important that this is recorded beforehand. Otherwise, following the immunization, they would be calling it post-immunization pericarditis. But I don't think that it is pericarditis. OK, so the dominant R wave, sometimes differentially, you can go. OK, now let's do this one. Uh, we go for a poll. Um, Poll is, can you take the poll off? Let me show you the choices. Oh, so this is uh, an EKG they give you. And then looking at this EKG, your thoughts are, it is likely a STEMI, it is unlikely a STEMI, it is just LVH, and it is LVH with pericarditis. This is a 41 year old, uh, came into one of our satellite clinic on a, on, a, on, on, uh, on uh, I don't see, I think this weekend, I don't know when, Friday or Saturday. The EKG, we make them very sensitive. So they are reading it as LAD. Oh. Okay. Wow. Tough competition. Tough. This, this is actually a good question then. It is almost uh, <laughs> equally divided. So nobody is thinking pericarditis, that's good. But this is uh, who, Jamil Bhai, you'll take, take on this one? What do you think? Uh, uh, in this okay. CCG, apparently, uh, I thought there is some sort of short fear interval, but actually not. The Q waves are a little bit thick in uh, lead two. And there is some ST elevation, looks like. Uh, maybe it's a J point elevation, not true ST elevation. And uh, and uh, so, so if I tell you this patient is uh, on dialysis and uh, ran out of medications and went to the quick care to get the medications. So that will change completely, right? Then you can uh, say- Just the clinical scenario is so much yeah. important here. Yeah, the clinical scenario. So, but to recognize the morphology, it is just simply LVH and LVH yeah, can- That's right. Yeah. Can produce ST elevation. Yeah. One thing is that whenever you have this sort of ST elevation, if there's a reciprocal change, that is helpful. Otherwise, yes. always we should consider Therefore, whether the patient actually have any chest pain or not yeah. before deciding that it's in STMI. Yeah, life can be tough, but, be, but what the, I don't know if you read the ESC guidelines, there is very uh, clearly mentioned some, when there is a question about uh, not convincing a STEMI, you can do the pathway like a left main, AVR, ST elevation, ST depressions, 
but ESC is very categorical that don't give litics on those situations because litics can be really harmful. In this situation, you know, it's a, our satellite clinic, they called us, I said, forget it, don't worry. If the clinical setting is this, and the EKG doesn't look like, and as you mentioned, there is no reciprocal changes and, and uh, the, uh, it is very much explanation for a, that with the LVH. Same thing I talk about type two, type two MI. If the troponin cannot be explained by something else other than MI, then it is type two MI. <laughs> the troponin can be explained anything other than MI, other than clinical MI, then it is type two MI. Meaning COPD, hypoxia, uh, sepsis, trauma, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, whatever it is, or double product, tachycardia, heart failure. If that small troponin can be explained by anything other than clinical MI, then it is not type one MI. And if it is not type one MI, the most pl plausible explanation is type two MI. Okay, so um, next one. So you, the, the, this is like, a, I think uh, I give it to our, our fellows, my, my collections. And they do this because they prepare for their morning conference in future. Everybody is assigned. So that's why the first year fellow gave me all these slides. But you already know that if the ST elevation, I say this every time there is a STEMI, that EKG only tells you ST elevation. EKG will never tell you MI. MI is a clinical diagnosis. And ST elevation, some morphology of ST elevation such that it really looks like acute myocardial infarction. Oh. And we need to know this, huh? but ST elevation itself can be present in a variety of other reasons, which is Brugada, oh. you need to know the morphology, early repole, you need to know the morphology, acute pericarditis. Takasubu is a problematic child because Takasubu can be exactly like ST elevation in mind. But until you do the echo or, or pro, uh, definitely cath, that is the standard, gold standard is cath, and then you don't see any epicardial, then you call it Takasubu. PE, we have talked about this, and hyperkalemia, we talked about this also. So this patient uh, was coming for nasal polyp. Look at this, 29-year-old. And uh, the, the uh, anesthesia is concerned that uh, this EKG is abnormal. So they wanted to cancel. Uh, so what, what will you do? I have left the EKG, the computer diagnosis as it is. I'm not hiding anything from you. So please vote. No mm -hmm. one is looking at you. When you vote, then you will have a, a commitment to study. If you don't vote, then you will probably not be convinced to study. Agree. They are very confident. <laughs> OK, so it's still a lot of people not voting. Please vote. So yeah, this is our lady poll. And then you don't need anything further, right, really. So uh, no further uh, intervention needed. Um, so this was a good one. And uh, what about this one? Seventeen-year-old. So they don't know. They call pediatrics. That they call us. So this was an interesting situation. So if it is, if it is a poll, it is between A and B. 
Let's see how we do. Paul, A, you will activate a STEMI. B, you will not call it a STEMI. Paul is on the previous EKG, not this one. So how many will call a STEMI? How many will not call a STEMI? The previous EKG, 17 year old. Okay, 85%. Those who are still calling it a STEMI, you are probably right that there is uh, ST elevation, but those ST elevation is actually, those ST elevation is actually not, the morphology is such, it is not ST elevation MI morphology, 17 year old, and the clinical picture is totally not in, in line with MI. So, it is very important before you call a STEMI to look into this. I have said this so many times and I will continue to say more times. You know, it's, it is amazing what, that I, I teach this, but it's still when there is an EKG comes into the resident or fellow's hand, fellows getting matured, the residents, they get overwhelmed with the EKG. I tell them that never ever let the EKG intimidate you because you always ask, what about the clinical picture? Then you have time. Don't get, don't get intimidated by the EKG. And this EKG, is it early repole or is it pericarditis? I don't know, but there is no myocarditis. Myocarditis is tachycardia. And if, they, if there is a little pericarditis possible, but there is no rub and the patient is not having any symptom of pericarditis. So it is probably early repole. Now, this is an interesting. 34 year old, end stage renal disease and had mitral valve, old vegetation coming to us with uh, missing dialysis and severe MR and then pulmonary edema intubated. And after that, we did the mitral valve ring, uh, bioprosthetic mitral valve repair. Uh, and then uh, patient developed this in day two of post-op, extubated, hemodynamically stable, and then suddenly uh, this EKG shows this. She doesn't have any symptom at this time. So you want to know the, what is the rhythm, now? But look at the P waves. P waves also, hyperkalemia, but look at the P waves as well. Mm -hmm. yes, so your options are the following because uh, there is tall peak T wave so correct hyperkalemia and then look at the uh, rhythm and you think that patient will need permanent pacemaker you correct potassium and observe correct potassium and then give a temporary wire and start dopamine Pull. and uh, be familiar with this T wave. You can't miss. If you see this few times, whenever you see next time, you will easily, I can bet that you will easily be able to pick, uh, diagnose this uh, tall peaked tented T wave. Only three differential maybe. One is the hyperkalemia, two acute coronary insufficiency, acute you know, Shamroth will tell you that there is some electrolyte changes in intracellular potassium and it picks the tall T wave. And then sometimes you can see this in LVH situation, but I usually go for the first two, the potassium high or acute coronary syndrome, very early before even ST elevation. But uh, permanent pacemaker, uh, bhai, 
মাফ করে দেন এই এটা পারমানেন্ট পেসমেকার লাগবে না এটা এটা আতারবাই দিস ইজ এক্টোপিক এট্রিয়াল রিদম বিকজ দি সাইনাস নোড ইজ সাপ্রেসড সাপ্রেসড বাট ইফ উই কারেক্ট পটাশিয়াম আই থিং ইট উইল বি ওকে এন্ড ইট ডিড গো ফাইন and one one observation i have look at the rhythm strip 2 yes it's a negative p waves looks like it it a trill rhythm but uh, 1 2 3 4 5 6 bit we can see the normal looking p wave that how do you explain that actually uh, thanks dr azul for your nice observation this is the sinus bit no doubtly in case of the abnormal that is ectopic rhythm particularly from mm -hmm. the atrial rhythm the intermittent sinus bit may appear and mm -hmm. what is happened here yeah. also that is this is the clearly sinus bit and those who actually likes to explain the ecg this is the atrial rhythm negative p that is negative p in lead to means that is the low atrial rhythm avr positives and the, uh, someone want to explain it is from the right atrium or left atrium for those you can see the just positive like you have been avl but we cannot see any p wave in the v4 v5 v6 this means this is right atrium many those who want to explain the ecg that is a low right atrial rhythm from this ecg and this is the one sinus bit so this is the ectopic atrial rhythm from the lower part of the right atrium as evidenced by the just biphasic or uh, some positive p wave in avl and uh, thank you otherwise half is high yeah I want to draw attention that look at the T wave. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you have a T wave due to other causes, you have a broad based T wave, but when it is due to hyperkalemia, the base will be narrow, relatively narrow, tall peak, narrow based T wave. Yeah. And then another important thing for the, because the P wave is, is a sinus node is gone, then can get no P wave. And then once the QRS gets widened in hyperkalemia, then the trouble starts. So be, be careful about that. It is very, very important to recognize this because you don't wait for the potassium level to come back. You start treatment anyway. And uh, one point I'd like to make in the management plan, because despite that hyperkalemia is still stable rhythm. If you can correct the potassium quickly, then you don't have to put a temporary wire or anything. Yeah. So your goal Absolutely. should be correction of the temp uh, potassium very quickly. Absolutely. And the patient did fine, no problem. Um, what is the uh, underlying rhythm? Now, we have talked about this. I just, again, the atrial flutter, but it is actually sinus. So it oh, is nice. not flutter. Okay, so I have, um, I have this uh, EKG and Fifty-three-year-old male with uh, osteoarthritis of the knee for elective total knee replacement, and this is a routine EKG. What do you do? So, will you call it a STEMI, non-STEMI, and concern and cancel surgery, echo and proceed with surgery, or? You just say palliative care. <laughs> I'd like to get an echo on him. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, this is why you are right, because it's difficult to convince the anesthesia. I would have said uh, that you don't need anything, but the patient does have history of shortness of breath. So you need to assess why the shortness of breath it is not likely to be coronary, but the echo will tell you something. And then cardiopulmonary and also look at the pulmonary function and then evaluate pulmonary. The important thing is that this patient has the elective surgery. So yeah, so it's good. Majority actually liking the echo and proceed with surgery, the echo is normal. So that's good enough. Okay. And another comment, Dr. Atahar, you can comment on that with the, how the R wave morphology looks like in particularly in V2, V1, V2, V3, when they have 
you know, multiphasic R wave goes down that far uh, that it, doesn't it suggest more severe RV involvement? involvement? I mean, definitely there's right bundle morphology, but question about whether so, there is a, some. Yeah, let me jump on this. Uh, uh, yeah. the, if the right bundle and then there is right axis and the R amplitude more than seven in the V1, mm -hmm. there is a coexistent right ventricular uh, hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. And in COPD patients, you may see that. And the patient has shortness of breath. So echo is actually appropriate for mm -hmm. that. So this one for Atharvai, mm -hmm. 57 year old with palpitation. And then, you know, what, what we call this, we talked this uh, earlier, is it AVNRT, atypical AVNRT, atrial flutter or atrial tack? Poll? So you, you want the poll, huh? First? Yeah. Let's do yeah. the poll first. By the way, this patient had eight cardioversions and then came to us and then told us, I'm not going to leave the hospital without ablation. Otherwise, He's correct. He's yeah. correct on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so AV nodal typical and atypical AV NRT. Okay, and then atrial flutter, everybody's right. Even E is, I don't know who wrote E because <laughs> there is no E. Um, but anyway, Atharvai. Yes, uh, thanks the participant for the, that is the most of the participant in favor of the typical avianity. And I am also in favor of the typical avianity as because it is the regular narrow complex supraventricular tachycardia in favor of the typical avianity as because there is no clear P waves previous. But yeah. we can assume, as because we don't have the sinus rhythm of this patient ECG, but from this ECG, we can assume that there is some R, that is, the, that is something like R, that is the R priming, what is called in V1, R priming, also in AVR, and something just distortion of the ST segment just after the QR is in lead one, and also in case of the V4, that is distortion of the ST segment just after the QR is, all in favor of the retrograde P wave within the 80 millisecond, that is small two square, within the 80 millisecond of the previous uh, QRS complex. So this is in AVNRT. If it were the AVRT, the retrograde P wave should be after small two square, that is after the 80 millisecond. And in case of the AVNRT, that is atypical AVNRT, it should be the long RP tachycardia, what is Rupix has uh, repeatedly shows, that is long RP tachycardia, that is a rit, that is an inverted QF just before the next QRS complex. So it is not the atypical event is as because there is, it is not the uh, long RP tachycardia. And as because that we can see the rate to get QF just after the QRS complex and R priming in V1 and AVR. So it is in favor of the typical AVNRT. So let me tell you what happened to the patient that um, I did my cath even after my second case, the EP lab is still going on. So I mean, to look at the other clumsy cute. The ABNRT, this is like our uh, mid RCA intervention, quick. But then there, and then the EP guy is saying to me, Dr. Resh, oh, this is interesting. I found an accessory pathway also. So slow, fast, dual in the AV node, and also found an accessory pathway. So they ablated that as well. So. <laughs> This is the reason I have a very funny relationship with EP because uh, they <laughs> found something else. <laughs> oh, but th this is interesting. This is this patient's EKG. Patient has Parkinson's disease, <laughs> hypothyroidism, repeat the EKG or place a temporary wire. Look at the, because EKG, if you read by the computer, sometimes it's funny. So, um, I, I'm not going to take any vote, but because I want to show you some real questions. 
uh, that sometimes the computer, the EKG baseline is a problem. I'm going to show you the board questions before we leave so that uh, this may be for future. And I was talking to Rafik by that, how we take this uh, EKG uh, little higher level as we make the uh, participants as they graduate. Um, and I really thank all the participants because I'm seeing 58, even at uh, 11 o'clock, it's still with us. You say that gives me a lot of inspiration actually. And I thank you who are staying that late. So this is actually interesting. So uh, the, this EKG, the PVCs, where the PVCs are coming from? Let me see anybody uh, would like to vote. Uh, this is a tough one. If you don't vote, I understand. But uh, this is from the uh, American College of Cardiology board question. I copied from that. These are not my patients. So where is the PVC coming from? It has inferior axis and then some kind of uh, bundle branch block morphology. See. So excellent. Okay, uh, good. So uh, the, the looks like RVOT, but uh, the answer is LVOT because of the uh, the transition of the voltage of the bundle in the V3 is too high. That is most likely from the sinus of Valsalva LVOT. But I think those who said RVOT is also correct. Uh, I would take that as a correct. Um, this one is important because this is a, a this is my uh, last but one. After this one more question and then I'll stop. 30 year old female, sudden onset of palpitation lightheadedness while playing with her children in the park. And then present to the emergency department, blood pressure good, heart rate good. And they gave adenosine, but did not work. At bolus adenosine with the central line, I mean, uh, large board cannula, and then she does not want to cardiovert. Which drug you will use next? Adenosine did not work. Which drug you will use? This what? is a right bundle and then left axis and little bit wide. So uh, uh, this is a fascicular tachycardia. Exactly. Fascicular VT. These are sensitive to verapamil. And the board expects that uh, you choose verapamil. And uh, so adenosine metoprolol out because this is not uh, the, uh, so sometimes you can check with the, uh, with the exclusion that, uh, and then ibutolide is not the drug to use and then uh, verapamil is sensitive. So these are all math question that you know or you don't know. And then I'll stop after this one. This is a very interesting patient. That's why I picked 69 year old, came in with history of chest pain, shortness of breath, hypertension, and renal insufficiency patient has schizophrenia. ECG um, is shown. This is EKG, that is the presenting EKG. And then patient um, was initial declined cardiac cath and then managed conservatively with anticoagulation aspirin with a blocker frusamide. And then did okay, did okay, and then uh, on the day of discharge, got shortness of breath and then diaphoretic, EKG virtually no change, if anything, little better. So he's untreated anterior wall MI, and they are asking that if the patient now tachycardic and has a murmur, and you can read the murmur, and then 
this is very important in the board exam they gave you uh, the description of the physical exam very important they give you they want us to make sure that we follow the physical exam right harsh murmur left sternal with the thrill and loud s2 s3 gallop s3 gallop means the edp is high and failure and now what are the possibilities i'm just trying to give you a flavor that what the board mm -hmm. actually asks. somebody asked me in the board what they ask this is the case scenarios they give you so the diagnosis is it is possible that she has free wall rupture or mitral regurgitation with pap muscle rupture or vsd ventricular septal rupture i would say vsr in the acute mi we don't call it vsd acute mi is post mi vsr ventricular septal rupture or patient is reinfarcting or it's the aortic cameral or coronary cameral fistula sometimes we see in dissection aorta to the ventricle or coronary perforation and ventricle coronary cameral fistula but it is because of the murmur usually you see a continuous murmur but it is not so that is out from the above four what do you think which one is happening here so free wall rupture usually patient becomes like uh, cardiac arrest or profoundly hypotensive shock and the prognosis is universally bad. In MR, following the MI, the patient goes into very quickly pulmonary edema. And uh, usually the MR murmur is softened. And the intensity of the murmur does not correlate with the severity of the MR. And it can be anterior directed, posterior directed. Following anterior MI, the MR uh, pap muscle rupture is uncommon because it has uh, multiple supply, dual supply. The posterior is more common. And this was an anterior oral MI. They want to make sure that you pay attention to that. And the question is, this untreated, we don't see ventricular septal rupture. After COVID, we are now seeing some VS rupture because of the untreated late. But usually, we, we almost were not seeing anymore. So this was, answer is, ventricular septal rupture following not revascularized uh, MI anterior wall. And usually these are apical VSD muscular. And, uh, and um, if you detect and intervene early, they are good. Some also claim for percutaneous, but usually uh, you treat them and then don't waste time, go to surgery earlier. So that's, I just wanted to give you a flavor that we deal with the cases I wanted to share what we get over a week and few uh, cases to present to you. So we are in the same page in terms of thinking and management. And then also in future, maybe we'll bring some uh, board review type questions so that uh, you get an idea that where we need to be uh, in uh terms of Dr. Hassan, I'd like to make some comment on this very important uh, you know, uh, case here, because make sure we really pay attention to clinical examination, because can you put that uh, previous slide that we had, uh, the MI complication slide? Yeah. The last one, la last slide. Yeah. Because I'd like to make a few comments, yes. The reason is, it's very important to examine the patient because, and particularly in the setting of Bangladesh, when we're primarily giving thrombolytic therapy, when there could be not, you know, a full revascularization, okay? The, first of all, we have, look at that, the patient has definitely, if there's a palpable trail, trail, always think about VSD, okay? And uh, there's a harsh systolic murmur, palpable thrill, and the loud pulmonary component is coming from the increased flow to the uh, pulmonary area. That's the P2 uh, loud pulmonary component coming from there. And the main differentiation of the papillary muscle rupture, papillary, uh, what's going to happen in the VSD patient will lie flat, okay? Because patient does not have pulmonary edema much. 
But the question right now, if papillary muscle rupture, the patient has flush pulmonary edema, they cannot lie flat. They are normally upright. So this clinical distinction, you might not hear a good murmur, it could be faint murmur because bent, a left atrium is still non-compliant, but it's quickly increasing the pressure in the left atrium. That's why uh, you, know, you don't see persistent gradient, you don't see prolonged systolic murmur uh, in the acute uh, papillary muscle rupture. Normally, they are, if the patient short of breath, upright, uh, and if the patient, uh, that is, uh, you need to think about papillary muscle rupture with severe mitral regurgitation. If they are sitting there, harsh, uh, you know, systolic murmur with palpable thrill, and that is probably likely VSR. Uh, so you need to keep in mind, uh, you know, immediately post MI. Um, and and uh, Aziz, why can I add something? Explaining. Aziz, yes. Huh? Yes. Uh, so regarding the murmur of VSR, it changes with time. Uh, with every day, it changes its character. Yes. And, uh, and in, in uh, papillary muscle rupture, it is fixed, harsh murmur. But uh, in VSR, every uh, few, uh, one or two days, there is slough out of the uh, interventricular septum and the, in, and the murmur get changed its character. And, uh, and it, I, I always... Uh, Tell my uh, fellows who work in the CCO, in the MI patients, particularly anterior MI patients, always auscultate to the precordium every day. You might get lot many clinical findings. Usually everybody uh, thinks that there, is, there should not be any clinical sign, but there are a lot of clinical signs and it persists for a few minutes or few uh, hours, like pericardial cardiac rub, is VSR murmur, papillary rupture murmur, sometimes, uh, uh, dysfunction of the papillary muscle gives rise to queen murmur like seagull. So these are the transient uh, uh, clinical findings can be found in an acute MI setting. And thank you, uh, Jamil Bhai. The important thing I wanted to also point out that unless we are aware of this, when you do bedside echo, sometimes you get pseudo confidence. You yeah. have a quick echo and you are not listening to the uh, uh, precordium, then you think that LV is good. And actually in MR and BSD, LV may look like good, but that is a false because hard, yeah. LV is trying to squeeze hard to overcome the MR. And then unless you pay attention with the color Doppler or the look at the septum carefully, you may miss it. That uh, if quick, uh, that's why I tell the fellows that when you do bedside echo, make sure that you know the patient and you have auscultated it so that you know that what, what you are looking for because it's very easy to miss this on a quick backside. The tech probably will not, in, in, in US, as you know, the technician does the echo. In Bangladesh, I know the cardiologist does the echo, but here with the tech does the echo and they go through so much system that I think that they have a less chance of missing compared to the cardiology fellow, third year even, because they got focused, fast echo, and, and they can miss. So it is better to know the patient. There's no reason not to know the patient, and there is no reason not to auscult it. And I auscultate before the echo, and I try to auscult it after, to check that what I missed after the yes. echo. <laughs> Yes. Exactly. And also important to point out that his lungs are clear, a patient's lungs are clear, you understand. So it's most likely yeah, it's not capillary muscle. Rupture. May, not be, may not be always a consistent. That is correct. Because, yeah. uh, in VSD, you may also get that problem. All right, I'll stop there. I think it is almost one and a half hour. So we are done. All right. Thank you, Habib. Nice cases. A lot of discussion. <laughs> Aski, do you want to uh, make a comment? Oh, thank you, Hafiz Bhai. So these are a really practical case scenario, which I, I think is very, very helpful. He's a very good teacher. And whatever he teaches is in a very good and humorous way. So it's always great to see you and Hafiz Bhai. Thank you for your Excellent presentations. I like and we are missing we're no. missing Rafiq Bhai. So Rafiq yeah. Bhai, sorry, can I ask you one? Is that progress going on? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'll send you the uh, the draft. Okay, sure.
so uh, I like the, the, the Dr. Uh, Arun Maske. Do you know the term Adda? Adda? Mm -hmm. so what Adda? Adda means to Adda uh, people. Adda means in Bangla is like gossiping. So, gossiping. Gossip, you know, but but uh, the gossip is little off. So actually, now in the uh, the what they call this uh, English dictionary, you can find the they have the British have accepted this term Adda, and I was amazed to see how nicely they have defined, because Wadud calls this our EKG Adda, but uh, I differ with the English dictionary. So they said that is aimless chit chat. But in EKG Adda, we have aimful chit chat. <laughs> very true, very true. But without the uh, added layer of formality. That's the beauty of this uh, uh, meeting. And this is great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Afiz Bhai, these were very nice pieces you have shown. Excellent Thank pieces. you. Excellent pieces. Okay. Thank you and good night. Shafi. Thank you, everybody. Yes, sir. Ali Shafi, you are patient. 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 You are Right, sir. But uh, now he is having some second thoughts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>